Hi everyone, um, Dairan speaking from Superdot. Um, I guess we are live now. There is always a delay in 40 seconds. But um, so I will just wait a minute to see that. Okay, I see online. Good. So uh, for all of us who are new here, um, maybe you didn't know who, who I am or who Superdot is, um, just for information. Superdot is a studio for information design, um, and since 10 years, we visualize complexity. Um, other thing, maybe you don't know what is on data and design. Um, it's an event series. Um, we started three years ago in Vienna, and the goal was to find the community who is in the intersection of data and design. And uh, after that, ba uh, Basel and Berlin followed. Um, and as you know, we have been doing physical events uh, with some nice beers. And since Corona, um, we switched to the virtual version uh, of these meetings, which opened up new possibilities to have also uh, Barcelona uh, joining in uh, for today's session. Last time we had New York. And um, currently, we have over 3,000 people, um, which is great, um, in different channel channels who are following. And um, if anyone of you wants to start a local version or any kind of version of on data and design, please let us know if you want to do that in your city um, or you want to have uh, give a speech, just contact me. And um, for all of you who do not know how this event works, um, there will be two talks tonight um, and you are free to ask questions over Slido. I have a second screen and I see all the questions coming in. So we will answer these questions after both talks. Uh, one little last announcement for all the young professionals and students. Um, there is a data viz competition about the sustainable development goals. So they are very important at the moment, the SDGs. Um, and this um, uh, competition is called SDG viz award. And it has been launched by the Federal Statistical Department of Switzerland and uh, the UN Data Forum, um, which will happen this uh, autumn. So for everyone who is interested in data viz, you should look into this conference happening. And uh, United Nations, uh, by the way, also is um, an initiator of this award for young professionals. So look into Google, probably just write SDG viz award um, or um, look into our um, streams. In social media, you will find information there. Um, there are great prizes to win. Uh, just follow up and uh, subscribe. There are even lectures uh, you can follow there about the sustainable development goals. So great things to support. So um, we have uh, two great talks uh, tonight. As always, um, and as usual, they will introduce themselves. I'm not doing that. Um, and I would already just um, hand over or kind of uh, give the stage to Paul. Um, please, Paul, introduce yourself. Tell us your story. Thank you, Darian. And, and thank you for inviting me here. It's an honor to be um, hand to hand with Cedric. And uh, yeah, I will let me share my screen so we can start from here. Let's start. Here we go. OK, can you see my screen? Yep, yep, works. Um, so I'm Pau Garcia. I'm uh, one of the founding partners of Domestic Data Streamers. We are a studio from Barcelona. We are over 22 people now in the studio and we work all over the world um, in 17 different countries. And we, our focus is mainly on, on experiments, on experimental ways of uh, experiencing information and data. Right? That means that we work from all kind of um, new ways to develop reports, to exhibitions, to installations, physical and digital installations. Right? And we have been doing so during the last seven years and this has taken us, and I guess that's the reason why uh, Darian invited us today to talk about space, to different, very different spaces. We have worked from, from the streets 
um, from hospitals, from even churches, um, from gardens, the nature, from um, ships, museums, and and this comes to like a very crazy and, 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 and weird relationship that we have developed with, with the idea of a space and what, how we understand space as being part of, of the material that we use to express and communicate uh, information, right? So I wanted to start uh, today by, by uh, showing this, this like thought on, of Hans Hollin that he said in, in the 68 at Baus magazine, he proclaimed that everything constitutes the physical world uh, can be considered architecture, right? And there was like this experimental architecture studio, uh, Trump Nobel, that in turn claimed that everything was fiction, that the role of the architect beyond creating spaces uh, to serve society, it was also to represent, criticize, and ultimately offer alternative fictions to the ones which form the basis of our society, right? He was kind of pointing out the role that architects have um, not only in, 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 in shaping the wall as it is, but in how it should be, right? And I think from data designers, we have like a common sense of that, right? And we should open this, 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 this door and this room of our discipline into not only visualize and represent realities, but also represent and, and confront and criticize potential realities that can happen. And this starts with questions, right? And this is the basis of, of, of our work and how we start any project we do with one question. Um, and today I will, I will show you three different projects, very different projects. Uh, the three of them are, are very experimental and, and somehow they, they kind of enlightened us through the way of understanding which could be like the relationship that we could have with, with the space and the way we, we transform information. And, and the first project that I wanted to show is, is uh, the third installation that we ever did. And, and was an installation that was kind of answering this question uh, for how long people want to live, right? which is the, the, the expected age in, into the, where people want to, to die, right? And this, this is a very transcending question. This is a question that you cannot do like lightly to someone right this is something that you have to create like the right context to do it and and we find that context in the design museum in, in barcelona where for eight hours over eight hours we were asking all the people that passed by the museum and um, how old they were and until what age they would like to live for right they were like the two questions that we asked and we have some tablets and we have like this database with all the information of the people that was just like explain if like the gender, real age, and until what age will you like to live? Right? And it was interesting then, like normally what we will do as, as, as data designers will be to visualize this information. As you can see here, uh, kids, they tend to think that they will live from 120 to 140. This is because they really don't understand the, the, the actual state of, of the Spanish health system. And, and as they grow older, they, they start to become more realistic about that. There is like this, this amount of people here over the 23 to 27 that, that they want to die very young rockers, I will say. And then it, it keeps between 80 and 90. And at the very old ages, they start kind of growing. And, and that will be like a, a, a way of representing information that is uh, quite easy to read and, and and, and very, in, in terms of, of logistics, simple, right? And, and then you can obviously use like different aesthetics to, to create all kinds of, of, visualization, of visualizations and show it in, in so many different ways. But what was kind of lacking for us was um, where is all the transcendence that we see in the question when we visualize the information, right? Where, where, we, where we can like bring all these um, like deep and symbolic experience that this question actually represents into the experience. So we started thinking about this term, like the concept of info experience instead of creating infographics or creating an, a whole experience. And that means space, sound, that, that means the materiality of, of it. And that means like a time, a specific kind of journey that you will have with, let's say uh, from 10 seconds up to Mm, 20 minutes, right? 
And, and this, I will show you a small, a quick video of one minute of, of the installation that we did on using this data. In life, there are things which we are able to decide and others which we can't. Death is one of those things that plays between these two possibilities, where one can decide when to die, but not for how long they will live for. 800 balloons mark the point between one's real age and the age at which they would like to die, in contrast with their gender. The white balloons are the coordinates of those who don't know at what age they want to die. Whereas the black balloons are the coordinates of those who do know at what age they want to die. A volatile and ephemeral peace that questions our desire to live and an irrefutable end of a journey. Or in other words, a lifeline. Right. So the installation, how it worked was uh, a, two, a couple of grids, square grids, where you will see like all these balloons starting all in white, the installation, and each of the rows, they will have a certain age for the way, the, the, how old you were, like this was like answering that question. And then the rows will be answering until what age you would like to live for, right? So at the very end, it created like this very kind of intrinsic experience of you giving the information by changing the white balloon by a black balloon and then making it rise as more questions, as more answers with the same point where uh, having a coincidence, right? And what we realized was that actually creating a space of information was uh, like making subtle changes in the way we um, kind of interact with information, right? So we are very used to read information from an individual perspective, right? From our phones, from our laptops, and in the newspaper, wherever, right? Uh, but actually creating a space of display was creating this collective reading. There were happening conversations around you. You were seeing the reactions of other people upon this information that, that was kind of changing your own way of reading it, right? The other part that was important was that uh, we were kind of switching a very kind of uh, historical way of expressing and representing information that is um, using this monologue from the person that knows to the one that is reading, that is receiving the information and is unilateral, right? So this is a monologue and I'm telling you this information for you. And in this case, we were opening a conversation so the people can could actually they were asked a question, they were answering that question, and in, and, and, and in return, they were receiving an experience, right? And that kind of conversation made something very different, made um, the people read the information from their own perspective. They were part of the information. They were part of this infographic, right? This, informa uh, this infographic and this info experience was not anymore about something that was out, that was um, out of their experience, but they were part of it, right? And the last one will be like the context that obviously if you want to ask such a deep question to someone, you need like the right context to do it. And, and, and it is important to create it, right? That's why we use uh, like so ephemeral materials and, 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 and just a minimal expression of aesthetics to talk about life and death, right? And that was kind of creating a kind of a comfort zone for people to express something because it was very odd. It was very out of the standards, so we could ask out of the standard questions to them, right? Um, and that was like kind of the learnings from this uh, third installation that we ever did, that it was quite a success at that point. And then we started experimenting with all, all kinds of, of different devices and in different like surfaces. And, and the second project I wanted to show is a project that we have never talked about. We just did it one time. And I'm very happy to finally like release it somehow. I, I, today I have been collecting images from the past to, <laughs> to show it. And, and this project is called Elena. And, and it was uh, meant to be an interactive conference 
kind of experiment and 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 it came from this idea of when you go to a gig to a concert and everyone lights up the lighter as a way of telling hey this is a, the best moment this is a beautiful moment we are sharing it together and and nowadays obviously there is not the lighter anymore but we are talking about phones and we said okay this is these are beautiful images we we should actually use that in a way to to actually um, talk and, and create this conversation within the public whenever we we do a talk right when we do a conference and and in a very modest not in a huge stadium but we did in a, in a school here in Barcelona uh, we started making questions and what we did was uh, we had this Kinect camera and with two string motors with a balloon that was lighten up with red and blue and then the Kinect camera will capture the amount of pixels with different colors and what we give at the entrance of the of the school was this uh, small cart with two filters, with two light filters. So we will have uh, red filters and blue filters, and we will be asking questions all the time, like uh, polarized questions, A or B, and they will use the filter to vote one thing or the other, right? Um, so the Kinect camera camera will collect all this information, and then the motors we we'll release some string and the balloon will get up or down, right? It was a very simple way of visualizing information and the people got really crazy. And it was interesting, not, not only because we were kind of opening this space of, of debate in a, in a space that you are not used to, because it's not really common to talk in, in a collective way to someone that is speaking, right? But it was also interesting because we did questions such as, um, how do you like the person that you have at your right, right? And you could see at the beginning, the people, right, placing the red dot, like, okay, I like it, but then blue, and then it was, it was kind of shaping and moving, right? So it was also a way of, of changing the behavior in the space. And I think um, that whenever we bring data into space, into a living space with people, um, this data brings meaning and, and the meaning, like, totally switches the space and, 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 and the behavior of people in it, right? Um, so that was also a very beautiful experience that we had um, more specifically on, 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 on talks and conferences. And, and that brought me to a, a reference that I, I love and I thought this is the perfect time to, sh to share it. And this is the, a project uh, from a urbanist at the Michigan State University that they decided they built up the campus, all the buildings, and they decided to not build the roads. They just like plant grass and uh, waited for a year. So the people will walk through the place and they will create like natural pathways, like the desired path of the space, right? So through like the path of the people, they, after a year, they will see which were like the most used roads and they, they will build over it. So somehow I thought that like, this is a perfect reference of how like you can actually bring and build a space um, creating a data visualization on the use of it. Like in this case, it was just erosion, but somehow it was a, a way of visualizing what should be done, right? Um, sometimes it, it happens with design that we tend to be, like, okay, like the users will go that direction and then this is like the best way and, and then the user experience go into another different way, right? So I, I think like somehow design have a lot to do and a lot to think about these methods and how we can integrate data and how we can integrate like this very conversational data into ways of building anything like from architecture to websites to any experience or human experience that we want to develop. And, and following this, this track, I will share like this last project that is more kind of a, a service design project. And, and this is a project that we did for a hospital for the Department of Oncology. And, and, and we were invited there to help them out. They didn't know exactly in word. Like we had like very good connections in there and they said, okay, come here and, and, and we will share like what the, all the work that we have been doing. We want to improve parts of the communication and, and parts of the experience, but we exactly don't know where we can invest it, right? So um, we were there and, and it was like really amazing. They have like state of the art machinery and, and they invest a lot of money in, in the last uh, technology that they can use to, to like cure people, right? And, but something happened and, and when we did the tour, we, we actually started seeing that there was 
kind of a very unbalanced situation between the um, the spaces that were not technological and that were not useful from a medical perspective, that they were just spaces of meetings, uh, waiting rooms, uh, and, and these were like parts of the hospital that they they were not designed. They were just functional and they had to be quick and. Um, at the very end, like it really, this was kind of where the people changed the clothes and everything. And it was, I, I, I saw that and I said, she like, you have a problem here. Like this is not the, the, the way, right? And so we pointed out that there was this imbalance and talking with the, with the doctors um, and, the, and the hospital manager, they told us, okay, yeah, but our investment has to be always invested in, in what, in return brings us more help, right? Or, or cure more people. So we cannot invest in things that are just aesthetical. And, and, and that brought us to a very interesting discussion and research upon which was the role of design in, in hospitals, right? And which was like the impact that it could have. So at the very end, what we kind of figured out was that uh, almost 12% uh, of the people that was receiving oncology treatments, they were um, leaving the oncological uh, treatments without finishing it because they were not like really up to like the whole process. The going to the hospital was horrible for them. And, and we said, okay, imagine that if from this 12% that leaves the treatment, we can retain 1% or 2% of this 12% because we improve the experience in the hospital, then you will be saving lives. Right. So we kind of find that that way of expressing that that could be a good investment. And, and we started doing a lot of uh, interviews and, and talking with a lot of patients and familiars and, and people in the hospital. And, and something happened that was that obviously uh, like having an interview about uh, a, a disease such as cancer that um, that is killing you somehow and it, it can be very hard and it can be very complex and it can be a bit uh, frivolous to talk about the experience of the hospital, right? Um, so instead of just making these interviews that we first did, we said, okay, we have to find a lateral way of expressing information uh, for all these people. So what we did was uh, bringing them uh, Polaroid cameras. And we, um, for a month, we gave Polaroid cameras to patients, familiars and so on. We asked, okay, take pictures of all the spaces in the hospital that brings you any kind of emotion. It can be good, bad, whatever, but take the pictures, right? And, and for that month, they will, we were collecting pictures, Polaroid pictures, and then we realized that we had a lot of pictures of the same places, right? And, and we started like kind of tracking the, 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 the interaction between like the space and the amount of pictures that people have taken. And, and for example, uh, we realized that one of the more used a uh, picture was the like the conciergerie like the, the the entrance of the oncology department and and it was very odd because half of the patients they were taking this picture and i was like okay then we started having these interviews why half of the people is pointing at that out then we discovered that the the conciergerie this this like the the, the entrance is only um open in the mornings. So everyone that comes in the afternoons for treatment, they are not received by a person. They just have a poster in there and they say, okay, you have to do this, this, and this. And this is like the a first moment of that you feel alone. Like this is like the a, a moment that you feel already sad when you see a shutter closed in a hospital that you are actually going to receive some treatment, right? Um, so other than this, we created like this little, um, like 3D printed um, characters that you see here. And each of these characters, we will, will be expressing a, a specific emotion. And we gave like this kind of map of the space and we started making these workshops with them where they will take these characters and show which emotion was happening in each of the, of the spaces. And, and something that happened was that um, the second learning that we received was on the, on the waiting room. So this was uh, the waiting room for one of the mo most harsh treatments. And, and the problem that they had here is that they, other than the, <laughs> the, the waiting room is super ugly, but other than this, um, the problem that they had is that they felt alone. And, and, and uh, I asked them, obviously, like, 
how, how do you feel alone if most of you come with 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 a familiar or with someone else and then they say yeah but i feel alone because when i'm waiting here i'm i'm alone with someone that is that have that have no cancer so i'm really alone here if there will be a, another patient here then like I don't know, there will be a sense of I'm not going alone through this whole thing. And then we asked the hospital, how was it that there were only one person all the time waiting? And they were like, okay, no, we have optimized the schedule so much that we don't have to make the people wait. That's beautiful. And we said, yeah, but this is making people feel like really bad <laughs> at that point. And they said, okay, we cannot obviously make the people wait more for this because this is like stupid and but maybe we can find other ways so what we did was creating this kind of dashboard on the um, on the waiting room where each of the patients will be given a box with all these characters each of them with meaning one of the emotions that they will be having and and they will be able to place the emotion every day they were going for the treatment and leave a message for the next people that will come afterwards right so at the end of the day you will see a full board full of all the emotions of all the people that had passed by this place giving you encouragement to the rest of people that will pass by later right and it was kind of a emotional visualization of the user, the user journey and and the patients will come and say okay oh maria had fear today when and i I'm, I, I also have fear right and it was kind of creating connections and giving leaving a trace in this space a kind of erosion of the space but in an emotional level and it was like, really nice because afterwards uh, after uh, like three months or, or so we came back to ask to the to the people in the center how it was going and and one of the nurses uh, came to me and said okay i had this incredible experience and and and, and that one day that i was i was going to to pick up one of the patients and and she told me and she showed me that that she had fear and from there she told me i, I asked her uh, what what do you all have fear of and she said okay the other day I, I heard that sound in the machine and i don't know what this means and and he could explain that sound but this would be something that would never happen without having an interface of emotions because he was never going to ask about emotion uh, at that emotional level on, on that process, right? So it was kind of an interface of exchange and communication. And at the same time, a visualization system, very cheap, very simple for a, for a space that is uh, at itself very aggressive, right? And, and that will be like the three projects that I wanted to share today. Um, I don't know. Great. Thanks, Bob. We have questions but we would discuss it afterwards. I, um, I would just hand over to Cedric. That's good. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, fantastic talk. Um, put a little bit of pressure on me, but um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I will jump right into the presentation. Let's see. Um, Hope it works. So oh, that should be it. You see the presentation? Nope, we don't. Rob, you have to the share your whole complete screen or something? Ah, here we go. Uh, now you should. Yes, works. Perfect. So yeah, um, I mean, let me let me introduce myself in the studio first. Um, I'm Cedric, Cedric Kiefer, I'm the co-founder of Informative, a studio I'm based in Berlin. Um, founded on Formative about 12 years ago with uh, my colleague, Julia. And uh, by now we are about um, 12 people working here permanently on quite a few different projects. And um, the projects that we're working on range from interactive media installations to digital art pieces, generative corporate designs, data visualizations. Um, yeah, it's quite diverse. And um, we are also not really focused on, on specific media, but uh, there's one thing that all of these projects have in common in one way or another, and this is that they somehow happen at the intersection of art design and technology. And um, one of the reasons for that is probably um, where we're coming from originally. Um, and I think one of the yeah, main reasons for uh, founding the studio was actually the co-publishing of the generative design book 
which happened about 13 years ago. And um, after that, um, yeah, Julia and myself, we realized that there's some kind of a market for this kind of work. And, and since then, we have been working in that field always. Or in the beginning, we started to really think about how can you use code, how can you use algorithm, how can you use data to actually design. And um, for that reason, a lot of the work that we have been doing in the beginning of the studio have been focusing on that. So we did a lot of data visualizations, infographics, could be print, could be animated. Um, but it was always trying to kind of like visualize some kind of data, sometimes also interactive, so bringing some corporate data into, into spaces. But at one point quite early, we realized that this is not exactly what we were excited about. So we were really more interested in finding new ways of creative expression using technology and data. So trying to be much more artistic and abstract in, in the way how we work and how we interpret data, but also what data means to us. And uh, I would like to share a few projects where we actually yeah, interpreted different types of data in a totally different way. And um, yeah, we, we still focus a lot on these spatial projects. And one good example is um, IBM Flux, which is um, data, data installation that we created for the new IoT center um, of IBM in Munich. And it's um, this, this physical data sculpture that is suspended from the, from the ceiling. And it visualizes the data that is actually collected inside of the building through different IoT sensors. So it actually detects like the, the user flow in the building, the network traffic in the building, and it actually shows that on these large screens. And there's also a second screen in the background where we actually give a little bit of background information of the type of data that is visualized at this moment because the visualization itself is quite abstract. And uh, the reason is that the main idea here is not to, to actually share concrete information, it's really more to give, yeah, to communicate a feeling, give an impression of what's actually going on. But the main idea is always to keep it quite abstract and artistic. And this is somehow the way that we have been, been working with data since then. And um, it, it's always an important question where the data actually comes from, because to us, this is, of course, uh, one of the important aspects when working with data, and especially for these site-specific projects, we always try to actually use data from the space or from the place itself. And another good example for that is a project that we did um, two years ago for um, a cultural center in, in Shanghai um, called Theater X, um, where we actually have been developing digital art and screen content um, throughout different screens inside and outside of the building. And the, the topic of this, this project and this digital art piece was the idea of urbanization or like cities in general. And we started to do a little bit of research in the beginning and we quickly came across um, one important aspect of cities in general. And this is that they usually grow and, and um, yeah, they have a lot of different grids from, from city blocks to streets. They, they often grow in a grid-like structure. And this is something that you see on a, on a macro level, like in the bird's eye view, looking, at, looking down on the city, but you also find similar structures when you actually look on buildings itself, so building facades, the windows, the structures of the, the skyscrapers. This is something that you find uh, in, in big and small. And, and we thought that this is actually quite interesting. And what we did was actually developing an algorithm which was actually picking up data from the city um, from different positions and generates actually grid patterns inspired by these references. So we were actually picking random places in Shanghai, capturing the data um, or some kind of data that we get from, from map services and actually turn that into abstract patterns. And these patterns are then used to actually visualize two modes. One is the day mode, which is quite simple, only showing like these yeah, grayscale facade like structures and we're playing with a lot of light and shadow. But then we are actually using the same data sets and the same structures to visualize the opposite, how a city actually appears at night, which is much more colorful, much more vibrant, inspired by these, yeah, LED lights and neon lights and advertisements that you see all over big cities. And this is a pretty good example of how we actually use data in a pretty abstract way to create 
kind of like digital art pieces. And, and this is what we often do, especially for these commissions. And um, another project worth mentioning is Collide. And so Collide is a project that we did for Dolby Laboratories in 2016. And they have this headquarter in San Francisco and they have this kind of gallery screen. And they invited us to create a digital art piece. And we were actually free to choose a topic. I mean, they wanted something that has to do with motion or, or animation. And since we have been working a lot with visualizing motion data back then, we actually thought a lot about it and we felt that this is something that we would like to visualize. Because um, when working, we have been working before that, we have been working with dancers and performers <clears throat> for a few projects. And there was one thing that these dancers and performers always mentioned. And they mentioned that when they actually perform and dance, they somehow have this moment of getting lost in the performance. When you're totally immersed in what you do in your performance, then, then everything surrounding you fades out. You're totally focused. So everything else becomes abstract. And we really like this idea. And we wanted to actually visualize how this abstract space could look like. So what we did here, we actually started recording motion data, analyzing how yeah, the energy flows through the body, what kind of muscles are activated when you move, but then also trying to figure out um, how the energy flows into the space when you move. And <clears throat> this is the data that we actually generated um, based on the motion. And we used this to um, generate different visual aesthetics. So based on this data, we created these really abstract painterly visuals. And in the end, we somehow interpreted um, this screen as the window into this abstract world. So here you see sometimes these body movements coming closer to the screen. So sometimes there's a moment where you see a body appearing, but then also quickly disappearing and fading in the distance again. And especially for pieces like this, or for, for this specific piece, music was a really important aspect because um, it's, it's Dolby Laboratories. Of course, they, they have a lot long history in, in sound. Um, and we, we thought a lot about how we can actually create music for this kind of piece. And um, yeah, the usual way of working would actually be you have video, you have, you have these visuals, you hand it over to a sound designer and, and they just do some sound on top of it. But we were actually thinking a lot about how we can stay true to the original concept, the idea of actually being immersed in this experience and being, yeah, being inside of this abstract visual world. And for this reason, we actually invited um, three different cello players and we put Oculus classes on their heads and we put them into this virtual world. So we actually put them into this abstract space and the visuals were actually happening in front of their eyes. So they were actually positioned at different places. So one person was on the left, in the center and the right. And the moment a wave was clashing in front of their eyes, they somehow started to react and, and inter, yeah, interpret the, the visuals spontaneously. And this created a really direct connection between the visuals and the sound actually. And it's a good example how we usually try to do things um, because of course there are easier ways to create music, but we often try to yeah, use technology or yeah, just try to do things a little bit different because this mostly also leads to different results. If you want to get something that is a little bit different, you also have to do it differently. But um, thinking about digital art in the, in the physical space, we have not only been thinking about how to put visuals on screens, but also to maybe rethinking what a screen could be and how to interact with it. And Anima Iki is a good example of that. And it's another project that we created with the main idea and question in mind, how people actually interact with digital art installations if you don't really tell them what to expect, if you don't tell them how to interact with it. There's no introduction, there are no marks on the floor where you need to position yourself. So we really leave it open and we, we use these installations also to observe and to learn from how people actually interact with our pieces. So this is a, is a 360 degree projection from the inside of this suspended sphere and it's actually equipped with different sensors. So there are microphones and um, cameras who 
track your motion, but also record the sound in the space and play it back to you. So if you get closer, it starts to slowly react and mimic your motion. And it was really interesting for us to see how, how people were using it differently. So by now we have it exhibited in about 20 different places from museums to festivals and every, everywhere people use it differently. At one place, they just sit in front of it and looking up as it would be a campfire. At other places, they start to slowly come closer and, and, and try if you can touch it. And then they realize that it reacts and then they start to move around faster and faster. And that's a really interesting experience. And um, yeah, we have, been, we have been developing a lot of these kind of digital art content for public spaces. But for the last few years, we also realized that there's a demand for this kind of work in a, in a more private environment, in your own home. And um, for the last four years, we actually have been working with Samsung, developing digital art content for their um, TV series, like for purely DTVs. So if you have a Samsung TV, it's it's pretty likely that you have seen some of these contents because we have been uh, the exclusive partner developing about 25 different contents. And these contents are not just kind of like visuals or images or videos, but they are all data-driven. So they are real-time generative data-driven pieces. Some more abstract, some more concrete, but they all um, yeah, are influenced by some kind of data sources. So for example, these visuals change from yeah, morning to evening, but also based on the weather, for example. Um, again, they could be quite abstract. So this one is another weather visualization, changing the colors um, based on, on the weather and the speed based on wind. This is another example also, again, based on, on um, weather data. But then there are some that are also just kind of like random or generative, constantly changing, creating abstract patterns. Some are really abstract and some others are much more concrete, but they all have this kind of like real time aspect. Some are actually, yeah, we also try to cover a lot of different topics, of course, trying to actually um, yeah, develop a lot of different aesthetics that um, fit for, for a large audience, but always keeping this really abstract artistic um, yeah, aspect in mind. And uh, this, for example, is one that is using sensors to generate some kind of simple physics. Um, and every, every hour they become free floating, but then they actually start to move back, becoming like a clock hand and showing you the time. So these ambient displays always have an informal character. They always have something that gives you an indication of, I don't know, the time of the day or, or the weather or the temperature. So here you can see it now slowly moves back to um, clock hands. Um, yeah, uh, and the main purpose or the main idea is that they really should change the perception of a space. And of course, this is only partly possible if you have like a smaller screen or a smaller TV, but we also have been developing the same type of content for the, the Samsung The Wall, um, which is a much larger modular um, LED or micro tile based uh, TV that they have been developing. And we have been developing quite a few contents around the idea of kinetic walls. So here the idea is really to have something that changes the perception of the space. And again, this is, for example, also reacting to wind data. So the speed is changing. Of course, this is a really abstract interpretation of data and it might not even give you much information um, besides um, being data driven, which just makes it more relevant to you personally. But then there's also the aspect of, of customization. Um, you can design things to make them fit your, your personal taste. And yeah, this has been a really long, interesting collaboration and partnership for us for the last five or four years, where we really developed a lot of different content. And, and these are the type of projects that we really like when it comes to um, client collaborations and commission projects. But as already shown in the very beginning, there are also quite a few self-initiated art projects. And it's a really important aspect for us um, having these yeah, research projects because they also allow us to push ourselves further, to develop our work further, and also to learn and then take this into, into new commission projects as well. And I would like to show two more projects. Um, and one is True Falls. Uh, True Falls is a kinetic light installation. And the inspiration for this project actually came from these analog displays, so flip dot or split flap displays that you know from airports. 
And they have, beside the analog look and feel, they also have this beautiful soundscape when you hear them clicking and flipping. And we were really fascinated by that. And we wanted to create something similar. And of course, you can buy these elements off the shelf and just create your own display. But we wanted to create something that is inspired by that, but it's, it's somehow different. And we came up with a mechanic that is actually based on different columns. So this is our soft first, very first software prototype. And the idea is that you have these columns and they are driven by one motor. And um, this column has, or each column has 25 segments. And the moment one segment rotates by 180 degrees, it picks up the one above it. So if you rotate it um, several times, you are able to actually turn every element black and white. And um, the nice idea about this is that the, the black and white is actually just light of a regular light tube. So these elements actually rotate around a, a regular light tube. And um, yeah, black and white is just light on and off, uh, true and false. This is where the name comes from. So the very first prototype here was pre-printed, but then of course we started to develop it. Um, uh, yeah, different type of quality, looking into CNC milled elements. And the nice part here was that the moment we switched from plastic or from, from ABS to, um, to metal, we have this clicking sound that we were, yeah, that we lost so much about the um, other installations, the split flaps. And the reason is that you do not only see the change, you can also hear it. So this is like one column. And then of course, we moved on developing multiple ones and turned them into this sculpture. And uh, here you can actually see how the, the final elements move around the light tube, just driven by one motor per column. And at this point, we had a really functioning display and we came to the point where we had to think about what is actually the content. If this is a display, what is the content? And we didn't really like the idea of just seeing this as a, as a display or as you saw in the beginning. I mean, theoretically, you were able to put the time on it, but the moment you put the time on it, you have a clock. And we felt that there's more to it. And we really liked the idea of actually not having any specific content, but yeah, observing the change between content. So what we actually did was writing an algorithm that was generating different abstract geometric patterns. So circular ones, um, rectangular ones, a lot of different small codes that were actually able to generate these different patterns. And we actually generate these contents the moment um, the transformation is done. So just imagine that we generate one of these patterns, but then we don't show the pattern itself. We switch to the next one immediately. And the only thing that you actually see is the transformation between A and B. You never really get to the point where you see A uh, or where you see the image itself. So at this point, the transformation itself starts to become the content. And here you can see this kind of cast forward where the images itself are just shown for a really short time. And everything that you see in between is the way how you get from A to B. So this is not intended because you can't really foresee what happens next. And, and this is what we really like about it. This is this constant change, this constant transformation. And you always see these inter, interim states of, of the transformation and the algorithm at work. And yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, a, it's a good example for one, one really important aspect that is part of a lot of our projects. And this is about making change visible and, and just showing transformation. And of course, you can also make change visible by change your perspective. And uh, one project that looks at changing perspective in two different ways is um, Meandering River. And Meandering River is a digital art project that we created in 2018. And the main idea came again from an inspiration that we found by looking for something totally different. And while I was browsing actually Google Maps, I came across these beautiful river patterns that you find almost everywhere on earth. And um, yeah, these rivers really meander and move through the landscape creating these beautiful patterns. And I didn't know it back then uh, or I never really thought about it, but these rivers really move through landscapes. You don't see it because it's happening so slowly, but if you look at satellite images over the course of, let's say, 30, 40, 50 years, you can really see how these rivers meander through the landscape. And um, 
yeah, the moment we, we see something like this, something that excites us, we, we want to understand how it works and we want to kind of like simulate and recreate something. So we actually wanted to create our own simulation of this behavior. And um, this is our code that actually does that. But to get there, you usually have to start reading a lot of scientific papers. And this is an interesting topic because there's so much information about that. There are universities who do nothing else than simulating river movements and teach how rivers actually evolve over time. Because it's, of course, also really relevant to city planning or agriculture. And um, yeah, for us, it's a really interesting process learning about these things. And this is our code exploration, how we started with the very first simulation and then really thinking about, OK, what can we actually visualize here? So this is the river moving. And, and at one point, you think about what other aspects you can visualize. So for example, you can um, color it based on the water pressure. Or you can actually not show the river itself, but really just show the particles that are actually flowing through the river. Or you can not show the river itself, you can start showing the, the landscape surrounding the river and how the landscape actually changes based on the river moving through it. Or you can actually yeah, draw the connection lines over time and color it. And at this point, the river itself somehow becomes something like a digital brush. You can start to draw with something like a river, which is a really beautiful idea. And at this point, we started to think about like, what is the visual aesthetic? What do we really want to visualize? And how do we want it to look like? And um, while working on this project, we of course also came across a lot of different other um, satellite images. And, and these are just screenshots taken from different places on earth. And we believe that they are already so beautiful on their own. So this already looks like abstract paintings. And for that reason, we felt that we need to stay close to this abstract look. So, we developed the algorithms and the code further to actually create these abstract interpretations of landscapes and rivers moving through landscapes. So what we developed in the end was this real-time application, which was actually generating these abstract landscapes and a constant changing river. So this actually became this endless running application that was just kind of creating rivers forever. And um, there's this really beautiful idea of chaos and serendipity and, and unpredictability because you don't really know what's happening next. I mean, you believe you know what's happening next because you think you can foresee where the river goes next, but then there's one kind of like jump at one point which changes the whole total outcome. It's, it's almost impossible to really kind of like simulate or foresee what's happening next. And this is a really beautiful idea. But on the other hand, it also makes it complicated if you think about creating music for such a thing, because how do you create music for something that doesn't have a start and an end, and that is unpredictable. And um, of course, there's things like generative music and, and digital music, and uh, we, we felt that we want to create something that actually feels more human-like. Um, we like the idea of having this piano play interpreting the, the visuals, thinking about how would a human piano player actually interpret these visuals. So what we did was actually we looked at it from, from a different angle and we thought about the, using an AI as a co-creator because if you look at the project then you actually have two parts. You have the visual part, the one that you see as human, the top part, and then there's the bottom part, which is the data underneath it, the one that is not visible to you, but that is visible to the computer. So what we did was actually inviting uh, five piano players to interpret the different styles that we developed in different Temporal. So we collected a lot of reference data. So they were actually reacting to what they saw on screen. So when the river was actually long, they played it faster. When it was shorter, they played it slower. Um, and everybody was interpreting it differently, but always how a human would interpret it. And this is what we actually then set into um, Google Magenta, which is machine learning for sound creation. And we trained the machine on that. And we actually asked the machine, how would you interpret this visual at this point if you would be a human and what the machine learned from the humans, how a human would interpret it and actually returned some MIDI files. And there was a lot of training and testing and you can also overtrain something, get it too complex compositions, but it was a really interesting outcome and experience for us. And we used these compositions as the starting point then for our own composition. So this is what I mean by using the AI as a co-creator. Um, so you're not taking what you get, but you take it as a source of inspiration. You can actually take what the computer did and start to create and start to build upon it and, and, and base your work on it. And I think this is a really 
yeah, beautiful idea of also how technology can be incorporated in your creative process. And I'm quickly showing um, a short video of the final piece, which was exhibited here the first time at Funkhaus Berlin, but since then has been traveling uh, all across the world. which also brings me to the end of my presentation. So thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, really looking forward for conversation and questions now. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. Um, actually, we're so good in time. So actually we have now 15 minutes. Um, there are questions. To summarize, as I understood, both of you, it's a nice contrast. Both of you, you are totally into experience, right? The user and the user experience. Um, Paul has shown the experience kind of in creating uh, the, the, let's say, art piece or kind of in the interaction, right? And and Cedric has shown kind of the the after it's done, the experience um, comes right in the in the space. So I have seen kind of different approach. The one is more kind of in the creation and the other one is after the communicating the complexity, the art piece. But both of you are completely into experience. Yeah. Um, okay. So what I, I have my questions, but I will now um, give priority to the questions which came. So actually a very high rank question is going towards uh, uh, Cyril. Um, uh, Cedric, actually, I see. And I was reading because it was someone said I had Cedric, uh, Cyril, but okay. So the question is what technologies, okay, the obvious one, what technologies do you use to design your work? Probably you um, didn't hear it the first time. Yeah, I mean, a pretty good, yeah, pretty good question because it, it's not obvious at first. And the reason is that we are yeah, using a lot of different uh, yeah, technologies and, and design frameworks and, and programming languages too to create this kind of work. So just to mention a few that we have been working with on the project that I shared, it's um, everything from um, processing open frameworks, UVDV to um, Unity, um, but also then just coding directly um, C++ and OpenGL. Um, it, it really doesn't, doesn't matter. And um, the reason is that in the end, you can do yeah, a lot of things with, with similar frameworks and it often depends on who's working on it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not this one, this one type of technology or software that we're actually using. We try to pick the one that works best in a, in a specific situation. And there are some pros and cons for, for some applications. So for example, if you want to have like a lot of screens and, and, and uh, for, for large scale media installations like VVV or Unity often comes in quite handy. And then if you develop, of course, um, something like the TV content, um, you cannot even base your work on such frameworks because you have to code natively on the devices. So there you have to build your own framework and, and um, 
do your own kind of work. So it, it really depends. I can't really answer this um, in general. I could potentially answer it for a specific project, but um, I think that's the answer. Yeah, I hope that helps. So basically, it would say kind of you don't start with the technology and go into the concept, but you start with the concept and then look which technology. Well, most of the time, best. yeah. I mean, there are some projects where the main inspiration comes from the technology that we're using. We have been working with a few projects where the technology was the main inspiration. Could be hardware, could be software. Then, of course, it's somehow defined. But usually, the concept and idea comes first, and then. Yeah, sometimes we also test out a few things and then switch technology um, during the process. But um, it's quite flexible, I would say. Cool. You have good people working in your team. <laughs> well, do you, do you have something to, to that question? How do you work with what technologies are also first concept, then you look into technologies? Yes, definitely. Like, well, sometimes um, whenever a client approaches us with very low budget, then we say, okay, let's, if you have very low budget, let's use something that we control and we can replicate um, on scale. Yeah. And then we have to be creative with the technology that we can deliver, obviously. Um, but this happens like, let's say 10% of times, like most yeah. of the times we work towards like an idea and then we decide how to make it happen. Thank you. Um, here is the next question. Um, what is the general field of study in college for these types of data visualization study called? Any relatable field which gives a direction to do such things? I guess somebody wants to learn the things you do. <laughs> um, Cedric, you want to go? I mean, how, maybe you can go first. I mean, I think. You might give a different answer than I do, but let's see. <laughs> okay. Um, then uh, I, I have I don't want to promote myself, <laughs> but but I'm directing a master here in Barcelona um, that is a master in data and design, and and mainly because uh, we found we found a lack of people that were uh, educated to to work within our team. So we uh, started working with Pompeu Fabra. It was a, a very important university here in Spain and Elisaba, that is the, the biggest design university, and, and to develop the master. And this is the, since the creation of the master, this has been the four years now, and this is like the second promotion. Um, and actually these days we are having like the, the final exhibitions of the projects. So if you check on our, on our social accounts, you will find like some of the results. Cool. Yeah, so I, I wasn't sure if this is really kind of a question for me because I wouldn't call what we do data visualization. Um, it's kind of more content creation, digital art and design that we do. And, and since um, we work uh, with a lot of different um, artists and experts from yeah, designers to coders, there's probably now not one answer again. Um, but um, it's a mix of people who come from like more traditional design um, Universities studied kind of graphic design, motion design, but then also people having experience with game design and of course coding. But what I can really tell is that almost everybody who works with us, um, no matter if they have studied something design related, always had a strong interest in learning on their own and, and um, on the side, because this kind of work is not really taught in schools or maybe, maybe it's getting better but of course, it's always taught with a really um, commercial focus. And, um, and usually people who work in this kind of field are just doing it on their own or there's a strong interest um, to that. Yeah, sometimes it's also just people who start as artists and then try to find niche where they can actually also make some money. <laughs> and then it's, it's, a, it's a mix. It's a lot of different interests that come together here. But what I can definitely say that it's really interdisciplinary. So we have a lot of people who are actually designers who have an understanding of algorithms and code. Maybe are not the best coders, but they don't have to be. They just need to have an understanding of how things work. And on the other hand, we have coders who are really high level, but also have good taste and feeling for aesthetics. And, and, and that's really important because in our work, it's usually 
a lot of yeah working together and doing multiple things at the same time instead of yeah finishing A and then handing it over to somebody else to do B and then just kind of like delivering the project. It's always a mix. Mm -hmm. So yeah. again, sense. it's hard to answer the question. Yeah, yeah. You have to be probably widely interested and ready to learn and to dive in, right? Cool. Okay, so well, there is one question to Paul. Um, that hospital that hospital waiting room board was interesting, but was wondering how did you handle the negative, sad comments from patients if there were any? Uh, we, we didn't, like there were negative comments if you, if you decide that they are negative, but they, are, they were at the end uh, just like comments on, on how the people felt. So it, it was like a very human and, and, and the people were very respectful, even if they were sharing uh, moments that there were very hard for them. But at the very end, it was not a bad thing to share this, this uh, I don't know, these feelings. So it, it was part of the installation to not only like share like really amazing and because it, it is not, it's, it's not a good experience. It's a very bad one. But so you have to be truth, truthful with yourself. And, and whenever you do a, a project like this, like the, <laughs> it have, you have to be able to manage the risk of something exactly, like that. Exactly, to take the risk. Yeah. And That's a good question. How do you actually, maybe it's not the question there, but I'm asking, how do you sell that risky moment to your client that he takes the risk? <laughs> Because both of you actually, you are always entering kind of a new area, right? So you don't know if it will work out or not. So there is always a certain risk because you haven't done that before, obviously. Yeah. So how do you, is there a trust that you have to build with the client or how does it work? Obviously, whenever you do something new, I think the first thing is that they have to see you so excited that they become excited about whatever you're doing. Uh, this is one thing. The other one is um, obviously your portfolio and, and the, all the work that you have done before. And, and this gave them like the trust to hire you. And I think whenever someone goes to, to Cedric to ask for any project, they know what they are asking for. I, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know. But yeah, I mean, you mentioned a good point. I think my, my impression is that especially for big clients, they, they need to see a track record of, of successful projects and they want to see kind of like you working for, for, for similar clients of a similar scale because they, because sometimes they can't take the risk. I mean, just imagine like a big company doing like a product launch. Um, it, it's also a big responsibility that everybody involved has. And, um, and that's also why you need to build the trust. And by trust, I don't mean like the trust with one specific client, but building your portfolio. I mean, the projects we did and the budget we got also grew bigger and bigger because people saw, okay, they can handle this type of work and, oh, they can do this type of work. And then, yeah, they start to trust you more. And one thing, especially in the very beginning that we did and that I can really recommend everybody doing is um, if you don't get the jobs that you want to do, then just do it on your own. I mean, that's what we did for quite a few of the projects. And I can definitely tell that whenever we deliver or, or release such a project like Mandarin River or Anima, you get requests for these type of works. People, that's the, that's the sad thing about kind of like these commissions. Clients often commission you for what you already did. They never ask you to do something new. That's, that's a fact. Um, and if you want to do something new and push yourself further, you have to kind of like show them what you're capable of doing or, or try to kind of like, yeah, give them an idea of what comes next. And um, for that reason, always try to invest in your own projects. I, I think we yeah, benefit a lot from that. Mm -hmm. Means good luck for the ones who start now. They have to start kind of building up their portfolio kind of for free and then they will grow into a business, right? Yeah, yeah, difficult, yeah. Same for all of us. Um, okay, so there is one actually lo longer question. Um, Okay, there is a special direction, maybe both of you. How could you imagine the transition from 
individual to collective reading from monologue to dialogue in a digital space? Question mark. Thinking of COVID restriction, restrictions, dot, dot, dot. Should I, I can read it again. <laughs> I have to read it. I have to understand the intention of the question first. Yeah. Uh, let's say, so it said, how could you mention the transition from individual to collective reading, from monologue to dialogue? Let's, let's, let's end it here. I, I, I think this is already happening, not in the best way on the digital sphere, but it's happening already on all the social networks. Like you can see that happening on Twitter and you can see that happening before on Facebook, Instagram, and so on. The, the problem is when you create these um, spaces of dialogue, but they are obviously controlled by a few. So it's not so open at the very end, right? But yeah, I think they exist already. <laughs> Oh. I'm still thinking about the question, to be honest. I'm not sure if I have a really good answer to that. Um, good. Don't worry. I, I might skip that, actually. Okay, good. Don't worry. So, um, okay, there is one obvious, uh, there is one general question, which is, is this video available afterwards? Yes, this video will be available afterwards. Um, and you are, you still can ask questions. Um, there is one question from uh, Robin to Cedric. Um, how long do you spend on realizing a project like uh, the river, the Mandarin River on mm -hmm. average? Yeah, I mean, our projects usually range from one to three months, some actually six months, depends on the project. These, these self-initiated projects like Mandarin River or True Falls could also take much longer because we try to do them in between different projects. So sometimes there's just like half a year of uh, yeah, pause where we not really work on this project because something else comes in. So we're also trying to use these projects to actually um, use the in-between time and um, yeah, make sure that we fill, fill the gaps between projects. So it's hard to say how long these projects usually take, but I can definitely say they take too long. They, they we, we, these projects need to need to be done faster, but the, the reason is that as much as we love working on them, they don't have the highest priority. I mean, of course, the moment you get some some uh, commission jobs, you have to put them first because they are usually quite tight. Um, but but even these projects usually yeah range from yeah one to yeah three to four months. So that's like the average. We don't have a lot of projects that kind of take a year or something. Um, except maybe these long-term collaborations like the Samsung project um, that we have been working on for several years, but then it's also something that really splits up into smaller projects with range about three to four months. So that's like the average for, for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, one question from my side. Um, you have been, I had the feeling that in both of your cases, you actually start with an inspiration or a question, something which is kind of in the, coming from a context. But I didn't have the feeling that you kind of start from, let's say, the client brings raw data, that it says, okay, that's my database, explore it, can you find something, can you make a story out of it or something, so kind of, the starting point is not the data set, the starting point is kind of the idea or the inspiration, did I understand that right? I think it's just because the kind of projects that we showed today that okay. I, I guess it we, they were more experimental, but obviously like this, the part of the work we do, obviously, at least from domestic is, is, is creating stories from, from data that they bring to us. Understood. Yeah, I mean, we probably don't because I think as a, as a studio, we're not really that focused on, on data, data visualization, working with data. If data is, is part of the project, it often comes from our end or we can like introduce the idea. So we rarely have clients that can like just hand us data and, and tell us, hey, do something. They usually come with a different intention. They want to have some creative content. They want to have an installation. They want to have something physical or digital or whatever. But um, it, I think it's just, just the, the kind of studio that we are, that we are not really focused on this type of, of data visualization um, compared to... 
Super. So um, I would say um, that we close it for today. Uh, Paul, um, Cedric, so thanks a lot. It was really great. I will switch off now the stream, so I will ask you to stay with me. Um, everyone who was following, I see it's still 65 people. Thanks. Great job. Um, and see you next time. Bye.